Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is Muskan from Datamatics. Thank you so much for joining the webinar on complex document processing and faster go live made possible with generative AI. To ensure we provide the best assistance, we have a dedicated questions tab where you can submit your queries and thoughts. We'll address them by the end of the session. Please note that all lines are on mute for the default settings of the webinar. To keep things interactive, we'll be launching two poll questions for you to share your insight. Additionally, stay tuned for a survey form, which will pop up at the end of the webinar. Your feedback helps us improve and enhance our further discussions. Uh, also, no need to take copious notes. We promise we'll send the session recording and presented deck just after the webinar. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Marla, who will be the moderator for this, dis for this discussion. Marla is a seasoned IT professional with over 25 years of experience in technology and with, with some of the largest global companies which orchestrates and support technology innovation and automation. Thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is now yours to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Muskan. It's wonderful to be here today to join you all. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to set the stage for um, what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, we're gonna start with kind of the concept of the traditional methodologies around document processing. And that would be um, things that are um, error prone, take a tremendous amount of labor, challenges around audit, tracing, tracking, as well as compliance challenges. So when we look at infusing generative AI and IDP, we look at enhancing your accuracy, enhancing your efficiency, but also adding some wonderful capabilities around multilingual access and particularly around the faster go live that Shash will be talking about later on in the panel um, and presentations. When you infuse generative AI and IDP, you not only elevate your document processing, but you can actually add strategic advantages based upon data that you already have in your existing documents. And using generative AI to access that data and really put your data to work for you to increase customer experience, to increase the turnaround time, to increase your cash flow, all of the wonderful things that you can do with the documents that you have today by layering that generative AI on top of IDP. So we will jump right into our panel of experts. I wanted to introduce um, Vebhav Bansal. He is the VP with, um, with Everest Group. He co-leads the, um, he co-leads the service optimization technology team there, the practice there. And through this practice, they look at all types of automation and technologies around artificial intelligence. So much like we're talking today around generative AI and IDP, his team also looks at RPA and conversational AI and all types of process intelligence, looking at both from the product side as well as the services side. Second on our panel is Shashi Bargava. He, is, he leads the intelligent automation products team for Datamatics. We're happy to have him here. He has over 33 years of extensive experience in multiple types of technologies and multiple domains. One of his uh, responsibilities as the head of the product team is to <clears throat> in investigate and implement new leading edge technologies into the intelligent automation suite and, and deliver those to all of the variety of domains and verticals um, that are our prospects and customer base. Shashi has also been instrumental in setting up and growing centers of excellence across all types of organizations to drive revenue and business success, utilizing the technology tools that he offers. So with, without further ado, um, I would invite both Vebhav and Shashi to present their perspective on generative AI and IDP and the fusion of both together. So I think Vebhav, I think you're our first up. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mala. Hi, everyone. Uh, so like Mala mentioned, uh, you know, I want to bring uh, forward a market perspective on, you know, what are some of the typical challenges we see with the traditional approaches and, uh, you know, then what does Gen AI bring to the table? And, you know, how can you make sure that uh, your Gen AI powered IDP implementations are a success? 
Right, so uh, again, uh, before before getting into the uh, weeds of Gen AI, I, I, I just want to spend some time around the traditional uh, IDP approach. Uh, and, and the word traditional is also a bit interesting here because IDP itself is, uh, is, is not that old, right? So it's just probably four to five years into uh, like a productized existence in the market. But by traditional, what I basically mean is the era of IDP probably before Gen AI, right? So, so that, that, that's the way you could consume that. Now, when we uh, look at uh, you know, intelligent document processing or IDP, basically uh, I'm talking about any software or solution which will you know, capture data from documents, understand the required intent, does the categorization and extracts the relevant information. Uh, and there, is a, uh, uh, there are a lot of technologies which are already available, right? Uh, coming from the AI uh, ML set of technologies, including NLP, machine learning, deep learning, uh, which are already existing, right? Uh, even before Gen AI came into uh, prominence. So if you consider the entire IDP workflow, right? There are four to five different stages, starting with pre-processing, where you know you are looking at uh, improving the quality of incoming documents and converting it into a more machine-readable format, followed by classification, uh, you know, where you are uh, trying to index and classify documents into certain categories. Uh, using again machine learning, deep learning kind of capabilities. Uh, followed by extraction, where you're extracting the relevant data, uh, again, using some of these technologies. And lastly, uh, post-processing, uh, where you do some kind of validations of uh, the extracted data with data dictionaries or other available databases. And finally, making sure that the data is seamlessly transferred uh, to downstream systems, which could be your systems of records or enterprise applications. Uh, towards the end, you uh, would also want to incorporate human in the loop element, especially for you know cases where the accuracy is a bit debatable. Uh, so, so, so that, that that's a typical approach uh, which we have seen with the traditional IDP uh, solutions. Now, again, like I mentioned, this is itself a very new area. There was a lot of things which were happening right earlier also, but there were some limitations uh, which uh, you know we used to encounter with these uh, kind of solutions, which we talk about next. Uh, we, we can move to the next one. So uh, talking about these challenges, right? So, uh, so uh, the first one could be, you know, around the lack of available training data, right? So because there are many cases where the data is simply not available or uh, in certain regulated industries like banking, healthcare, and so on, uh, you can't really actually get that data, right? The enterprises are not uh, willing to share that data. It doesn't make sense, right? So you need some... Uh, so you face a problem of getting the right data to train your uh, machine learning models. So that's one. Second is, again, you have to make a lot of investments in training your machine learning models. So, uh, uh, so, so, so a lot of time goes there and uh, you know, the time to market or the time to deploy these solutions uh, is, is quite large. Uh, the accuracy levels, again, uh, especially with more complex and unstructured documents, were not that high. Uh, for semi-structured and structured documents, uh, they were still uh, reasonably good, uh, even with the traditional approach. But with unstructured, uh, they, they, uh, they were not that good, right? And lastly, uh, post-processing capabilities, right? So, you know, if you have to, say, generate some insights out of documents or you want to summarize information from certain documents or just query documents, uh, you know, without really converting unstructured information into structured information. So all that was not uh, very efficient. Again, I'm not saying these things are were not possible. Uh, they were still feasible to some extent, but the accuracy levels were not there. So these were some of the typical challenges which we uh, saw with the traditional approach and uh, which uh, Gen AI has a promise to really solve. So having understood uh, you know, these challenges, uh, let's see what Gen AI brings to the table. Uh, so firstly, uh, again, uh, like I said, uh, the first challenge was with learning and training. You know, Now with generative AI being available and a lot of these uh, pre-trained models being available. So you can actually rely on very less number of documents. I mean, in certain cases, you can actually do zero shot or one shot or few shot learning, which basically means no documents required or very small number of documents which are required for training your models. Uh, you could actually use Gen AI to generate synthetic data where the data is not readily available. 
uh, you could use Gen AI to create uh, workflows for the IDP processing automatically. And that's where, you know, uh, uh, formats like co-pilots come into picture. Then generative AI could actually uh, help in doing traditional extraction and classification work, which is the core of IDP, more accurately, more efficiently. Uh, uh, and uh, again, uh, I think uh, there, there's a need to extract, you know, important information like key value pairs, which sometimes are not possible with the traditional approach, but Gen AI, uh, you know, has the ability to do that. And then some of the post-processing capabilities I talked about earlier, like, for example, you can actually query documents directly, you know, without uh, the need to pull information or convert it into structured format. So in real time, you can query documents and, uh, you know, in a question and answer format or through a chatbot and get uh, answers to your queries. Or you can summarize your documents or, uh, you know, compare, say, two contracts and see what are the differences between the contracts. Or if you have two ID proof, uh, say, documents of a person, and you want to compare whether they belong to the same person. So those things are very easily possible uh, with, with Gen AI. Uh, even, I, I mean, all of us are probably more aware about the generation capabilities uh, of, doc, uh, say, when, when it comes to document generation or even translation. Uh, so, so, so all that is, uh, again, made possible and uh, made possible in a better manner uh, with Gen AI. So let's let's move on. Uh, now, uh, having understood, uh, you know, the applications or the ways in which uh, uh, Gen AI can augment IDP or enhance IDP, what is it going to uh, yield for business users? You know, what are the key outcomes that is going to impact? Uh, so, firstly, definitely higher accuracy, which I've been uh, talking about uh, uh, for a while. Uh, but at the same time, higher, uh, you know, straight through processing or STP rates, which is again a very important metric uh, for IDP, uh, which basically means, you know, how many documents uh, can be processed without uh, really a human intervention. So, so those rates uh, are definitely going to be higher. Now, how much higher? Uh, I think we 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 have early estimates uh, based on which uh, we uh, we feel they're they are at least 15 to 20 percent higher. But again, uh, I think some of these things are still in early stages as we see more evidences coming out, we get to know more about what's the real impact on uh, some of these metrics. Secondly, faster training and deployment times, which uh, to some extent I already touched upon. Uh, thirdly, from, an, from a developer perspective or from an employee perspective, you know, better productivity because today uh, you can actually take a model and uh, you know, use it uh, for your IDP solution and uh, do some of this work in hours rather than days. And lastly, uh, the turnaround time for end-to-end -end document processing, you know, as a result of all these efficiencies, that will get reduced uh, significantly. Uh, and, and probably that's the biggest advantage for a business user. Okay, so having understood, uh, you know, the Gen AI's uh, impact uh, on IDP and how it can augment, uh, before we move ahead, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, a poll for you just to understand your perspective. Uh, over to Marla uh, to, you know, help you uh, in understanding what uh, the poll is about. Yes, hi, thank you. Thank you, Vibhav, yes. Um, on our first poll question, it's actually a two-parter. Um, the question is, has your organization implemented Gen AI and intelligent document processing? And then the second one is, how crucial do you believe having generative AI capabilities is in an intelligent document processing solution? And so um, would love to get WebHub's perception on not only the criticality of it, but, um, but kind of what, what have you seen in the implementation percentages or effect? WebHub, did you have a perception on either one of these questions? Yeah, so uh, I mean, let's let's see what the poll results say. Okay, so um, I think twenty three percent of the people here say that uh, they have fully adopted. Uh, okay, and uh, I think there's a significant percentage which have not uh, really you know adopted it as a part of IDP. Uh, I'm just reading the response for the second one where, again, I think most of the people do believe that uh, this is going to be moderately to highly important. 
uh, for IoT. So thanks for your responses. Uh, and uh, at Average Group, what we also uh, did was we did uh, surveys with a wider set of enterprises uh, and, you know, just ask them similar questions on, you know, basically how is uh, uh, Gen AI uh, going to impact IDP, intelligent automation, and what kind of adoption have they seen uh, till date? Uh, so if you move to the next slide, we have some of those, uh, you know, results showing up and uh, uh, just, just reflecting on uh, the poll results from this group. So basically 61%, and this was a survey which was done for 50 plus enterprises across geographies, across buyer sizes, across industries. And from that, what we found out was, uh, uh, you know, 60% plus or 61% were, uh, you know, exploring and actually doing pilots and POCs around Gen AI. And the survey was done late last year. So, of course, the numbers might have improved uh, since then. Uh, out of uh, the entire respondents, there were 22% who had actually deployed it for one or more processes. Uh, and, and this is still not specific to IDP, but this is more around overall, uh, you know, Gen AI adoption. And 20% plus or 21% were actually planning to spend a significant amount, which is greater than 5 million in the next year, 12 to 18 months on Gen AI uh, adoptions. Those are uh, significant numbers. And like I said, this was still done like three months back and in uh, the Gen AI uh, space, three months is a long time. So of course, uh, things will have changed since then. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, just continuing with some of the other results, and these are uh, this one is specific to intelligent automation. So I think a lot of enterprises attach a great importance to Gen AI when it comes to you know its impact on overall intelligent automation or business process automation landscape. So especially with Gen AI, uh, we see a significant uh, uh, you know uh, importance attached over the next couple of years around its impact. And what you see on the right hand side is uh, the expected impact on different intelligent automation technologies. Uh, so uh, some of these like IDP and Conversation AI and RPA at the top of the list. Uh, talking specifically about IDP, 70% plus respondents actually think that you know, Gen AI is going to have a significant impact on IDP, which I think is similar to uh, the outcomes we had from this poll. So, so, so it, it, it's in line with that. Now, uh, again, uh, while all, uh, you know, this looks really great, uh, of course, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, there aren't, uh, or there haven't been challenges on the way. Uh, so uh, Gen AI, when it comes to uh, enterprise adoption, I think there are uh, some of these challenges which need to be overcome or are being overcome. Uh, and some of the top ones which emerge out of our uh, you know survey with enterprises is uh, number one is unproven ROI right so uh, I think all of many of you would have heard this already right so Gen AI is like not a silver bullet right it, it can't be applied everywhere so it's important to really assess which use cases does it make sense and uh, uh, the ideal way uh, to deal with it is you know you should orchestrate between your classical or traditional AI and Gen AI when it comes to uh, implementation for real world or enterprise use cases. So uh, again, that, that, that's probably the most important part here. The second one and the second big one is around data privacy and security. Uh, especially in the last year, 2023, uh, there were quite some concerns around, you know, how this is going to work out, uh, how, how the data is going to be accessed, how it's going to be stored, uh, how, how do you make ma maintain enterprise confidentiality with the data, how is your data not subject to IP breaches and all of that. So uh, again, the, these are the top two ones. And uh, again, as we move forward, we'll talk about how some of this can be addressed. Uh, maybe we can we can move to the next one. I also wanted to quickly take you through, uh, you know, what emerge as the top considerations or probably some of the best practices which could help in a successful adoption of uh, generative AI. Uh, again, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, some of the top ones which emerge here are, you know, having a very robust policy. Uh, and which is in compliance with regulations. Uh, I, I think, especially for Europe, you know, we have this EU AI Act and other regulations which are coming up, which will get effective in the next one or two years. So it's really important to comply with those to prevent uh, cost of non-adherence. Uh, some of the other important ones here are, you know, having right guardrails or, uh, you know, trust layers for data security and privacy. 
uh, having a comprehensive data strategy and doing a lot of data readiness assessments before you get into enterprise adoption, prioritization of use cases and thinking about ROI, uh, having the right talent strategy because you need to have multidisciplinary teams when you think about chasing uh, Gen AI problems and having human in the loop for very important or critical tasks rather than leaving it just to uh, Gen AI. So those are the important ones uh, which which came uh, you know top of uh, the list as a part of this survey also. So uh, lastly, uh, you know I just want to talk about uh, how uh, you know this could pan out in the future. What are some of the trends we see for this year and probably the year to come uh, on Genia's impact? Right. So uh, just going through these, one is you know we can. We can expect emergence of more industry specific and you know smaller language models because uh, with large language models you can definitely uh, you know target more horizontal or generic problems. But when it comes to niche uh, industry specific problems, uh, sometimes they could fall short. So it makes sense to uh, use some of these smaller fine tuned models. The second one is cost, which again is a big concern with Gen AI. Uh, I think some rationalization has already happened when it comes to hardware and LLMs, uh, but because of lack of supply on some of this, I think uh, the providers are still at an advantage. But over time, I think those things will get ironed out and we should see more cost rationalization happen. Uh, thirdly, uh, regulations I already talked about. I think regulations typically are slow. They are not able to catch up with innovation, but we, we might see that changing in the next one to two years. So you could be uh, you know, cautious of that. Uh, talent, uh, again, there could be a tussle for talent. Uh, it, it has always been the case in the last couple of years, but we could see even more of that happening with Genetive AI. And lastly, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, especially in 2023, we'll saw a lot of, uh, you know, evolution happening in larger language models or which are text-based models. But going forward, we could see even greater advances in other modes or formats. Uh, I mean, we already see emergence of LVMs or large vision models, uh, you know, basically images, audios, videos, those kind of formats. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of evolution happening in those spaces. Yeah, so, so, so that's about uh, what we see for the future. With that, uh, I'll hand it back to Marla uh, for another poll. Uh, over to you, Marla. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bedhub, for that um, insightful presentation. Um, we are looking forward to, to Shashi um, following up shortly after this poll. So poll number two is, are you satisfied with your current intelligent document processing solution? This can be everything from any type of document processing. So if I'm using Gen AI, if I'm not using Gen AI, if I've got a manual shop, if I've got, if I've got some combination of IDP um, solutions, just in general, you know, what is your satisfaction with your current solution? And I think that should be coming up soon. Um, Vepa, what have you seen from the people that you talk to that have implemented Gen AI? Do you find the satisfaction rate? Are they getting the ROIs that they're looking for? Yeah, I mean, uh, Marla, not, not, of course, in every case. And, uh, you know, while IDP solutions are uh, uh, meant to be consumed uh, off the shelf or at least with minimum configuration and customization, but at times what we hear is, you know, there's a lot of customization and all needed, which sometimes customers are not very happy with. And of course, uh, some of the dissatisfaction with, uh, you know, processing more unstructured kind of documents. So those two come to mind immediately. Uh, but let's see what the audience has to say. Oh. Okay, it looks like we've got a variety, which is great because that means we have an audience that's full of people that either don't have solutions, are looking for solutions, looking to replace solutions. So um, we appreciate everyone in the audience participating in our poll questions. And we will um, move to Shashi Bargava now to talk about from a product and from a solution perspective. Uh, thank you, Mala. Uh, and thanks once again, Vaiva. It's a pleasure to have you along with us on a webinar like this with a lot of insights which you gave it from the industry perspective. <clears throat> we keep talking about it, but today you really gave some very good pointers on the IDP and how the Gen AI has changed 
over the last, I would say, nine to ten months. And uh, that's exactly, I think, we are seeing a big change coming in with our customers, our prospects. So with that brief, let me just quickly run through what Datamatic's uh, intelligent automation platform is. The Datamatic intelligent automation platform consists of basically three products. The first one is the robotic process automation. The second one is intelligent document processing. And third one is a business intelligence tool. And all three are powered by a lot of AI ML models. We have our own models. We have our own IPs, Datamatic has own IPs, classic AI ML models. We can use it. And all three of them have been enabled using the Gen AI covering various use cases. Like we have co-pilot in all the three products. Like you can use a Gen AI enabled conversational bot using natural language. You can go and create the bots. In the first case, in the RPA, you can make your bot very intelligent by using the Gen AI component, Gen AI capabilities. So far, what you've seen in the RPA is processes, existing processes are being uh, automated. Now you can bring intelligence to those product, uh, products, processes. And second one is IDP, which we'll talk a little more about the detail. There also we have got a co-pilot and a lot of features which web have covered it which is what the market is looking for. And we have also done some of the unique features which we'll talk about today. And BI also, now we have got a co-pilot for creating the dashboards and the reports using the Gen AI. And it's no longer you need to go and analyze the dashboard to report yourself. You can get the summary, you can get the pointers, you can ask the questions on the dashboard using the natural language query. So that is what we have done. And Gen AI has really changed the way the whole product is going to be. Now, coming to the true cap and the generative AI integration, if you look at it, now we see definitely the Gen AI is becoming the brain of the IDP. As Web have also mentioned, like whether it's a classification, whether it's extraction, the complex documents that you want to extract from, where it's very difficult to go by the classic AI ML model, you don't have enough data to train on it. I think this is becoming Gen AI has really, really become the brain of the IDP. Now you can go ahead, we can train with the private data that uh, anyway will be required as Web have also mentioned to get the kind of accuracy from the Gen AI models which are there, whether it's LLM or SLM, you will require some kind of a training with the private data. Now the third very important feature is you can have inline data querying analytics. So far, if you look at the previous generation of the IDPs, what you basically you extract the information or the data points which are there on the documents what you see is what you get kind of approach. But with the Gen AI coming in, I can do contextual searches. I can get, I can do querying on the document. I can do some analysis with documents and I can get inputs for making further decisions on it. <clears throat> Another feature we have brought in is the data fusion, the convergence feature, where basically depending on the use cases of the document, whether it's a complex document, maybe we are using classic AML models, we are using different Gen AI models. There are different LLM models available, as Pebo mentioned, some are generic, some are domain specific, some are vertical specific models. We can use that and try to give the highest level of accuracy, which you everybody looks in, into the IDP. Cost optimization is a big challenge. And we do understand with the Gen AI coming in, the cost is high. Sometimes it's very difficult to define and get the ROI which customers are looking for it. But with the kind of new models coming in every day, with the kind of uh, even the hardware cost, as we have mentioned, will go down over a period of time. Looking at the different models, different use cases, we allow you to kind of optimize on the fields, various fields using different models, optimize on the cost so that you can get a proper ROI on top of it. We use a lot of public external model. We give connectivity to that. We do data enrichment. Now it's no longer just extracting a name entity or key value pair. We can go much more than that. We can do a summary. We can do some kind of analysis. Like we are working on right now currently on the certain LLM in case of a reading, even analyzing the medical images like ECG report or X-ray in this IDP products. We can do a lot of complex validations using business-like prompts. Okay, earlier we have to write it, and Weber also mentioned customizing the IDP has been one of the pain points for a lot of customers here in an LCNC kind of a thing. Just by putting a natural language prompt, you can do this kind of validation. Another key thing which you are seeing coming in the synthetic data and document generation for some time for the training, you do require data and the documents, and 
many a times we see with our customers we cannot get that thing there are challenges in getting that thing and we can use gen ai to generate those things and take it forward with that same way we are looking at right now where the work is going on even adding new type of data sources so far it has been documents now we are looking at audio and videos also getting process to the idp you can get the audio recording you can get the video recording you can extract the kind of information or the data points which are looking for it so that's all these are the different kind of features coming in and i'm sure many more are in the pipeline as the gen ai technology is evolving it's getting mature a lot more such things will come to that next slide muskan please now this is what we've got a product where we've done a co pilot in the complex for the complex document processing so in a true cap product which you have our idp you put a document it auto classifies the document you don't need to now go and train the classification model by giving certain set of documents and training what kind of a document it is if it's a publicly known not very very private document the classification happens automatically using this copilot the ontology or the document definition or the different fields which you want to extract from this document that is also created automatically the system suggests and that's why we are using the word copilot i think it's absolutely known uh, copilot is the most popular word getting with the gen ai nowadays so it creates identify the fields from that particular document and it puts in there a smart selection of context specific fields as well so certain fields which are looking is specifically contextual fields that also can be identified using the copilot we create lot of rules the validation rules which are also a part of the idp configuration for a particular document those rules can be also automatically created using the copilot another big advantage we are getting is this multilingual support we have seen many customers of ours who are like processing documents same documents across different countries in more than like maybe 15 languages 20 languages but the processing is basic process is same and to understand those documents we need to understand the different languages and it's many a times difficult to get the expert for each and every language here using gen ai we enable that thing in both in terms of defining the fields in the document definition or even extracting the data from the various documents another in this copilot is when we say leverage public llms yes we do go and we can access and as everybody knows in this call that there are so many models coming on every day llms slms they are coming in and we have the flexibility to connecting to the right llm to get the right accuracy two things are very important number one is the accuracy and second is the cost so both the things you can balance by connecting to the right public llms which are available out in the market okay. yes the advantages of copilot we have tried it out with some of our customers some customers have gone live with it some customers are doing pilot with it it improves the productivity going up to 50% like setting up a new document which used to take let's say a week or two weeks three four weeks kind of a thing now it is actually become in days and we have seen customers going live in three to four days with all the it permissions in the place so our solution is the true cap is on saas and we have taken few of our customers within a week of deciding they want to use it and they've gone live with it because of use of this copilot we could go very quickly instead of like finding time with the business users or the smes so multilingual support as i just mentioned it for many customers we have like you know more than 15 languages we are processing the document and now it's much better with the gen ai and the copilot coming in yes muskan next slide please some of the major highlights of our true crop product is a template free for each document type we don't have to go and define a template for each kind of document which are getting in we are using generative ai as i mentioned we have self learning thing self learning model as and when you keep processing more and more document some of them requiring human intervention the system learns it from there and the model gets mature day by day as you use it and the stp as we have mentioned is state through processing or the fields getting extracted automatically and correctly that percentage keeps going up we do auto classification in the cognitive caps cognitive capture again we have lot of classic ai ml models in built already in the idp along with the gen ai we try to maximize the kind of stp rate which we are looking for it our product is soc2 type 2 compliant so it's all secure it's running on the azure uh, cloud as of now in a multi tenant mode 
We do have a studio for baselining and model training. This has been a pain with a lot of our customers who required, like you read a really a data scientist or a Python programmer to go and train the models. What we have done in this case is the low code, no code. There's an ML studio. Even the smart business users can go and train their document and train the model on their own. They don't need a developer kind of profile. We have come out with a marketplace where we have more than about 60 odd ontologies ready to use ontologies. We just can just download it, put it in the system, and they can start using it. We have a complete operational governance, operational analytics, business analytics, the health of the system, the whole reconciliation of all the documents which are getting processed, accuracy, STP rate, everything is available as a part of the product, and the whole detailed security and audit trail which is very important in some of our customers in healthcare segment and the banking and insurance, what you have seen, this is extremely important. A SaaS space, low code, no code kind of platform, users can go and configure their product in the field very easily. And now with the co-pilot, it has become much more easier. We have a completely inbuilt intelligent workflow. End-to-end -end workflow is there right from ingestion till the extraction and export of the document. Yep, let's go. Next slide, please. Some of the other features are multi-channel data processing. We can ingest document through multi-channels, through email, SFTP. We can put it on a drive, G, the G drive, S3, AWS S3, any kind of thing we can pick the data from. We integrate seamlessly with many RPA products because as an AI product platform, people use RPA, using RPA, they can call through CAP for extracting the data from the document and make it a part of a flow. We do OCR convergence, which is one of the very unique feature for us. We have a multi OCRs enabled in the product. And if you're looking for a higher accuracy, we process the document through multiple OCR and converge it to give you the better output. We can do a lot of data validation and look up with all the different kind of databases available to you for validating and making sure the data is much more higher and accurate. We do complex table extraction. And this is one area we work with. A lot of documents come with various types of tables, and we have got a our own AIML model, which uses and extracts the table information from the various documents, and we extract it from there. There's a confidence-based score for doing the state through processing at the field level, which user can go and define it and take the output accordingly. We integrate with a lot of DMS systems like SharePoint, FileNet, others. We can in pull the document, and we can push the document back to the systems. We do handle unstructured document. Yes, as we have also mentioned, with Gen AI coming in, our unstructured document extraction and analysis has picked up quite a lot. Even handwritten also, we are working with a lot of work is going on, a lot of R&D is going on on the handwritten side of it, and we are doing it uh, quite good on that, on the handwritten part of it. We also do barcode, QR code signature, photo identification, logo classification as well as a part of TrueCap. Yep, let's go to the next one. These are some of the technical features. It's a queue-based architecture. We do have a knowledge base. It's a RBAC is there. We encrypt the data. Many of our customers are worried about the data security. We use the customer's key to encrypt the data. So there's absolutely no problem. It's a multi-tenant using REST APIs. We can go ahead and integrate with the various systems. Yes, Muskan. Next one, please. This is a very high level TrueCap architecture, which we have it. As you can see on the left hand side, there's a system input block. These are the various methods by which the document can be ingested. The main brain is between the data processing, where you have a lot of input processing rules. We do the classification, we do the splitting of the documents, same type of document, homogeneous and heterogeneous, different kind of a documents we can split there. We do a lot of image enhancement and pre processing to improve the quality of the image. Then we do OCR processing, and then we have an AI-powered extraction engine, which is AI, Gen AI, a lot of extraction pieces, models. We are bringing it in every day to improve the accuracy. Then we have a validation and HITL, human in the loop for the knowledge worker to review if the document requires it, and then it can be exported. We have a true cap studio for doing the model training, image profiling, and we also have a feature for bringing your own model. We have seen customers coming in who have trained their models, and they want it to be used for the extraction in the true cap, and we can connect that and do that thing. Complete administrator block for dashboards for providing operational and business analytics, and the output also can be given in any of the format. Typically, we have seen people using REST API in a JSON format data is taken. OK, next slide, please. 
this are like you know this are some of the experience this is a kind of a volume of data which we have processed using this true cap 300 plus million documents handled annually we have processed 12 billion worth of invoices annually 25 million claim process annually so this is just to give you the kind of numbers what documents number of documents which you process using the true cap yep next slide please yeah this is another case to enhance the, these are some of the use cases. I think we'll go ahead and share some of these use cases slides with you. But this is one of the European bank which automated the data capture, improved the productivity by 90%. Their processing time reduced from 12 minutes to one and a half minutes. And they've seen almost 100% accuracy achieved in extracting the data. Okay, yep, next one. This is about a global insurance company which we have it where we achieved about 99% accuracy using the true cap and uh, reduces the timing by 76% reduction in the turnaround time and their exception rate reduced, which are the business benefit from 13% to 2% and we have won multiple awards with this product across the thing. <clears throat> okay. Next one, please. Yeah, this is just to give you a one slide idea about data matrix. Okay, we are deep in digital to and our aim is to boost the productivity and the customer experience. We have almost 300 plus customers worldwide. We are present in six countries and we have a delivery centers in the four regions across the globe. And yep, that's all from my side. Back to you, Mala. Yes. Thank you so much, Shashi and um, Vebha for your insights on um, not only the landscape in the industry, but also the data medics products. I wanna jump right into some panel questions. So we might be able to get a little more insight on, you know, from, from your perspective and your experience, what you're seeing out there. So I'm gonna start with Vebha, if that's okay, and jump right in. In the early use cases that you've seen that have been successful, what are the use cases in generative AI and IDP that you've seen that the customers are realizing those ROIs? And just to tack on a little question about pricing, what are some of the successful pricing models and your perception of the pricing models out there? Sure, my love. Uh, so uh, you, answering your first question uh, around uh, you know early use cases which are finding some traction and which are uh, where we are finding some adoption, right? So if, if I consider, you know, last year, right? So a lot of this was still pilots and POCs and experimentation. Uh, in fact, we did, uh, you know, one research and as a result of that, we found last year, you know, 85, 90% of pilots were actually not moving to production, right? So due to some of the other reason or some of the challenges which we talked about, they were stuck. Uh, but uh, uh, again, uh, talking about some of these early use cases or the functionalities which are available. So, of course, the very first thing which uh, uh, the entire market did was to create, uh, you know, connectors to uh, LLMs, right? So it could be like an Azure or, 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 or OpenAI connector, right? So those were the first set of things which got done. And then I think this led to uh, other solutions, for example, co-pilots or, you know, agent assist kind of solutions. They were uh, a bit early on to the market, largely because uh, uh, there, there was a, a human element involved, right? So they were still less critical. They were aiding developers uh, in, you know, building better workflows. Uh, so, so those were, uh, or, or providing business users with self-serve capabilities. So I think those were uh, another set of solutions which went like. Now, with some section of the market, we are also seeing some other kind of use cases going live. For example, you know, something to do with better contextual understanding, you know, stuff like uh, I, I talk about question and answer tool or querying, uh, you know, documents or uh, uh, tools or uh, add-ons for uh, summarization uh, or search, right? So those kind of uh, use cases, again, we are seeing uh, 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 getting adopted or going live. That's great. So that's what so that's from the use cases, talking about, uh, you know, pricing models or commercial models, right? So my perspective here is, uh, I mean, commercial models are usually sticky, right? So they may not essentially change, right? So if today, say, for IDP, right, the commercial model or the predominant commercial model is, say, usage-based pricing, right, whether it is per document or per page, I think that is going to stay. Uh, it's not going to suddenly change because of generative AI. 
Now, what we are seeing is, uh, you know, uh, the way in which market is incorporating the cost of Gen AI uh, as a part of the pricing, right? So there we see some constructs emerging. Uh, for example, you know, some providers would be offering uh, core or basic capabilities free of cost as well, or as a part of their existing offering. Others might have increased their, you know, traditional pricing slightly or maybe 10, 15, 20%, right? So that there is some accounting happening for the Gen AI cost as well. Uh, there is another section of the market which is now also offering uh, an option to, you know, uh, to the enterprises to buy AI credits or tokens, right? Which again is a consumption based pricing. And, uh, you know, at times they will build tiers around it, you know, like to till a certain level you pay and then if you need more, you pay more. Uh, so, so that's how it largely is. Uh, I mean, going forward, I see probably, you know, a lot of these capabilities will be offered as default capabilities as a part of the core product, maybe with similar or slightly increased pricing. And then there could be an additional advanced set of capabilities for which, uh, you know, there might be additional cost. Uh, so that that's how I see at least for the short to mid term. That's great. That's great. Yeah, because uh, you see you see it all across the board. So <laughs> so we appreciate that insight. So I'm going to jump into um, one of the topics that we didn't discuss during the presentation, and that was around hallucinations. Um, and do you see hallucinations becoming more or less of an issue as the landscape matures? Is that responsibility of a, the generative AI provider, the responsibility of the IDP provider? What what do you see? Um, okay, uh, Mala, that's a lovely question. Okay, and uh, we do see a lot of people coming across and all the LLM models which people are using, chat GPT, the most common one and the different LLMs coming. Hallucination is there. That's a reality. Okay, when the best of the models are giving around 93, 94%, on the generic use cases, which we are looking at it. But coming to this using Gen AI in the IDP, okay, if you are using in terms of like a co-pilot kind of thing for creating the ontology or the document definition, there are hardly any kind of a errors or mistakes are acceptable. And that is where we need to train those LLM models which are using it with some kind of a private data or training, what Weber mentioned, some kind of a fee short learning or something, we need to do it to make sure that the hallucination is as minimum as possible. But going forward, as far as the extraction is concerned, or doing analysis of a document, what we're seeing is genetic models may not fit all the game, all the cases. You may still get a lot of wrong data. If you if a very generic case is like summarizing a document, genetic document, those cases will fly very well. But if you are looking for industry specific things like we have seen in healthcare, we have seen in logistic, we have seen in insurance sector, those sector you need to have either a vertically, vertical domain centric LLM models, which you can call or train with your own private data to get much better result and reduce the hallucination. So far, the technology is not that mature that somebody can go and guarantee 100% no hallucination. I don't think that is happening as of now. But over a period, I do foresee maybe it's moving so fast, maybe six months, one year down the line. Probably we can see that kind of a thing. But as of today, I don't see that. Thing. Uh, over to back to you, Mala. Okay. If I, um, Great. If I may, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, if I may slightly add on, uh, right? So uh, I think one of the other ways in the, which probably today is finding uh, more adoption is also around prompt engineering. So I have a lot of answers probably to hallucinations lie in better prompts, right? So, and when I say that, you know, it could be, you know, simple stuff like, you know, asking more clues-ended questions or defining the context properly or basically telling Gen AI what not to do, you know, when, when you are writing prompts. So those are simple things, but uh, which which might be tricky at times also, right, for, for users to understand. So those actually can help in reducing hallucinations a lot. Apart from, of course, what Shashi talked about having more domain specific and fine tuned models and all of that. Okay, great, great. Um, I have one more question for the panel before we go to um, to uh, questions that we have online. I want to make sure that the audience um, gets their questions in as well. So um, when you're looking at data privacy, um, Vebhub, this may be for you because you mentioned this on your slide. How do you see vendors and LLMs addressing the data privacy concerns? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, when I look at data privacy and security, there are probably uh, you know two or three different ways to look at it. One is, uh, uh, of course, uh, like why wh why do you need that? Uh, I think the regulation itself uh, is evolving, right? So the first and the most important need is to comply with the regulation, right? So I think the regulations need to be taken seriously. I think if I'm right, EU AI Act might actually become effective by probably 2026 or something, right? So, but so th that gives, still gives a good window for uh, you know everybody to comply with those regulations. But once those are there, I think the cost of non-adherence might be severe. Uh, secondly, from an enterprise standpoint, uh, there has to be really a proper governance mechanism before you even think about enterprise adoption, or at least when you think about scaling up. Like pilots and POCs are still okay. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why so many of them didn't move to production because, you know, these things are not thought of, uh, you know, when you talk about your processes or policies or mechanisms or defining roles and responsibilities of who is going to decide, uh, you know, in some current situations. Uh, so those things haven't been thought after. Then a third aspect would be on the technology side, right? So, uh, uh, of course, I talk about guardrails, right? So there have to be guardrails or, you know, some trust layers when it comes to uh, data. Uh, I mean, you can you can work either with a controlled data set, which is based on, uh, you know, uh, specific enterprise data, uh, or you use, uh, or in combination of that, you use some data anonymization and masking techniques. Uh, I think, uh, so there is a, for example, there's a technique called differential privacy, right? So which is one of a widely used technique when it comes to anonymization. So you can actually use those kind of techniques or even, even if needed, some solutions to, you know, check inputs and outputs or prompts and outputs, right? So to, 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 to understand if uh, you are breaching any data uh, security aspects. And last but not the least, maybe something on user training, right? Uh, and, and that's where some of this stuff I talk about on prompt engineering, which seems to be simple, but is not that simple, right? So, uh, so, so that can also help. Yeah, yeah. There'll, there'll be prompt engineering classes in colleges. We just, it's eventually. <laughs> yeah, I think that's happening already. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we did have a couple of questions from the audience since we're coming up on five minutes. Um, um, Yasani has asked about, and this is very technical, so I'll let either one of you chime in. Do you believe that the greatest challenge lies in developing triangular models that minimize the need for acquiring training data from customers and then mitigate compliance issues? So I'll okay. let either one of you take that up. Yeah, so Yasin, that's a wonderful question. Even you have one more question earlier about, uh, the models being used only Gen AI versus the hybrid one. And trust me, when we are having IDP product, we have seen it in many use cases, the classic AI ML models, sometimes even plain rule-based models give much better extraction than the Gen AI. So you had one question out there. So I'll tell you, that's why the product like ours, 2Cap, provides you in a hybrid kind of an approach. So you can go and select different multiple models for different fields or a different document types, the whole combination is there. The ultimate aim is to get the highest accuracy and the highest STP rate. Okay. Now coming to the question which you had on this uh, uh, triangular model, training about it. Yes, sometimes it becomes very difficult for to get the data or the documents from the customers. Okay. And many customers are looking for, and especially with Gen AI coming in, they think that everything is ready. They can just go ahead and start using it. Okay, but many cases it's not possible to get the kind of accuracy which you're looking for it to the customer is expecting. In that case, yes, some training is required. There are various ways of training it. You can take a classic AML model. You can take a Gen AI particular model and train it with the private data, host it as another instance and use it and take it forward from there. Okay, okay. back to you, Man. Um, that's great. Thank you so much, Shashi. I think that answered actually, actually a couple of his questions. And uh, we did have a question from Patrick. It, he said that public sector government uses a lot of paper, as we all know. Yeah. Um, and this may be a WebHub question. Do you see use cases around government and healthcare also in, in any of these great paper intensive um, verticals? And um, And yeah. if you don't see interest do you see that interest coming down the line? 
Yeah, no, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, government and public sector is a place where we have seen a lot of interest coming, especially after uh, the entire COVID phase, right? So uh, uh, the sector has definitely been a late adopter of, uh, you know, overall intelligent automation and IDP. But in the last couple of years, we've seen a very good growth rate uh, coming from government and public sector. There are a lot of use cases. I mean, uh, there are a lot of documents lying out there which uh, are yet to be digitized. Uh, 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 government, public sector, even education, uh, public education for that matter, uh, there, there are uh, libraries of documents or old uh, records, which even handwritten documents or documents which have a very poor quality. Uh, so uh, the, the need to you know convert all of them uh, uh, is there. So uh, in fact, one of the fastest growing uh, you know market segments when it comes to you know IDP and overall intelligent automation as well. Okay, that's great. I think, so um, I can just add on to that, Mala. I think there are a lot of use cases both in government and the healthcare. Okay, healthcare one of the very most common case the use is the health claim forms. Okay, you get different kind of insurance, health claim forms, healthcare, even medical prescription, medical documents. So a lot of the cases are coming around there. We can use the Gen AI based IDP product to take care of it. Yeah, back to you. Great, great. Um, and we had another question on um, from Patrick. It says, um, a hallucination is a failure of the model. Is that something that gets corrected through additional training? And you also mentioned, Web Hub, you mentioned prompt engineering, right? Yep. So um, is it a training um, combined with prompt engineering? What what do you see as the as the method and mode? Yeah, again, I, I, I can uh, take a stab and then maybe she can add, right? So uh, Again, I think it's it's not really a failure in the model as such, but uh, it's largely coming uh, because, uh, you know, especially these proprietary LLMs, right? So they are trained on a huge data set of public in, uh, information, right? So you have uh, the sources as, you know, the Wikipedia of the world, right? So where a lot of this uh, stuff, uh, uh, a lot of these models are getting trained on. And that's one of the reasons for hallucinations. So especially when you use that generic model and apply it to some of these enterprise problems, uh, there, there, there could be false interpretations, right? So that that for me a key reason. So that's why some of those controls or you know that fine-tuned models or controlling what you're asking is more important. Also, maybe taking uh, you know uh, no as a response rather than taking a false response, right? So uh, we, we have seen cases where. Uh, uh, some of these applications uh, like chat GPT will throw anything. Uh, we would rather, for enterprise use cases, we would rather have no response or response getting directed to somebody rather than, you know, getting a false response. So, th so that, that's my perspective. But uh, Shashi, you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that's a good point, Webhal. So both the things, Patrick, if I look at it, number one, yes, the prompts have to be really proper. You cannot go and say that the model, only the training, Okay, and uh, training also can be done. You can go and train and have your private instance of the model running with your own data, with your own private data. And you can also put li limitations that, okay, if you don't get a right answer, don't give it better to say no than giving a wrong answer. So that is one. Second is using the generic publicly available LLMs. I think it's the whole strength lies in the prompt engine. How good the prompt you can write, how, can, how well you can tell the LLM don't do this thing, do only these things as specific as you can be. And that is where we call this a common sense for writing the prompt is the most common thing which we needed. Okay, so it's a combination, how better, how good the prompt you can write and how much LLM is being trained on. And that is where you see sometimes the chat GPT-3 versus chat GPT-4, different LLMs coming in, vertical domain LLMs coming in now. And that's what is picking up quite a lot. We see a lot of traction coming out there and that also trained with your own data. I think that can only will reduce the hallucination. But still, my belief is that as of now, we cannot say 100% hallucination will be removed. That's my take. Yeah. Over to you, Mala. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, as we wrap up, I think there was a couple of other questions and we will get back with those questions via email to get those answered to those individuals. And um, wanted to thank Webhub and Shashi for your insights today, for joining us, for answering questions. 
and hopefully the audience gained, um, got some great takeaways and gained some insights as, they, uh, as they're leaving as well. If you, have, if you would like additional information um, on the topics that we talked about, please feel free to email events at datamatics.com. Someone will get back with you on that. And then keep an eye out for the recording link and the presentation deck. They'll be sent out shortly after the webinar closes. Also, we are always looking to improve and make um, interest, create interesting content and relevant content. So surveys are always appreciated. If you could uh, respond to that survey at the end of the webinar, it'll come up on your screen. We would very much appreciate it. So just a special thank you again to Vebhav and Shashi for your time today. We very much appreciate it. And for those in the audience, um, stay safe. And until next time, you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Marla, and thanks, everyone, for joining.